imagine going to the most snobbish, elitist, expensive education in India, and I was forced to go to one of them. I was all set to be a diplomat, doctor, teacher, engineer, and that my family expected me to do that because the family actually decides what you should do in your life. I don't look it, but I was the Indian national squash champion for three years, <laughs> and I played in Australia, played all the greats, and I was all set to be going into things which now I consider very boring, but I went to a famine for the first time in India, and I saw death, starvation, hunger for the first time, and it changed my life, and I said I would like to use the education that I received for the good of the very poor in India. So I went back home and I told my mother, I'd like to live and work in a village. Mother went into a coma, because she said, what is all this happening? You know, everything is laid out for you, and all of a sudden you want to live and work in a village? Something wrong with you? I said, no. I want to give something back to society, and I want to go into a challenging position. And I'd like to see what the world is like at the other side of India, the rural side of India that we weren't exposed to. So then she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an unskilled laborer digging wells. That didn't go down well at all. <laughs> didn't want to speak to me for many years. But then I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills that very poor people have. People who have nothing, but such tremendous knowledge, skills and wisdom was, was out there in India and it was not being valued, not being utilized, not being respected. So I thought I would start a college only for the poor. What the poor thought was important would be reflected in the college. I went to this place for the first time. The elders came to me and said, are you running from the police? I said, no. <laughs> You failed in your exam? I said, no. Didn't get a government job? I said, no. What are you doing here? Why are you in this place when you have got the best education possible? Something wrong with you, you're not telling us? I said, no. I want to start a college only for the poor. I want to live in a village voluntarily only for the poor. So it's the only college in India that should you have a master's or a PhD, you're disqualified to come. You have to work with your hands. You have to respect traditional knowledge and skills. And you have to redefine professionalism. Who's a professional today? A professional is someone who has a combination of competence, confidence, and belief. A water diviner is a professional. A traditional midwife is a professional. A traditional bone setter you find in villages all over the world are professionals because they are being respected by the communities. Incidentally, they may not know how to read and write. Incidentally, they may not have been to school and college. So, this is a very powerful definition. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be someone who can't read and write, but someone who can't learn, unlearn, or relearn. You know what Mark Twain said? Never let school interfere with your education. <laughs> education is what you receive from your community, your family, and environment. School is where you learn how to read and write. So, the Barefoot College is 500 miles southwest of Delhi. It's a very, very small village in Thelonia. 45 degrees in, in summer. Sometimes it does not rain for five years. So, they respect water. So, when we said, that we want to think that there is a difference between literacy and education, they said, tell us, where are the skills that are available in villages today? So we built the first barefoot college in 1986. This man is our first barefoot architect. He still can't read and write today, but he's built me a whole campus which doesn't leak, which hasn't collapsed since 1986. So they must be having some skills in villages today, which need to be respected. It was built at $1.50 a square foot, and that's what it looks like today. The college has a community radio which works off solar. 50,000 people actually hear these uh, the, uh, the programs on um, social media, on uh, social messages, on political messages, on health messages. And this is run by women who still can't read and write. 
It's the only college in which is already connected by optical fiber cable. We have video conferencing from that college. It's the only college which has a books, which has 40,000 uh, book library. And it's a college which has a speed post. So if you should happen to buy some Tilonia handicrafts off the internet, it reaches you in Australia in seven days through that little post office there. We also believe in taking physically challenged people and training them in different skills, um, water testing and, and uh, communication skills. And the priority of the Barefoot College is to take physically challenged people and also women. We have a dentist, a grandmother who is a dentist who can't read and write, looks after the teeth of 7,000 children. Maybe in six months after some assistance from Italians, we might, they might be able to do a root canal. How's that? 60% of the children in India do not go to school because they look after ca at cattle, sheep, goats, but they have time at night. So we started the night schools of Thelonia. 75,000 children have gone through these night schools at night. These were first uh, lit by kerosene lamps, but now they are lit by solar lanterns, and about 7,000 children go to these schools. Over 225 schools all over India we run for these children. The beauty is that these children every three years have an election. Between six to 14 years, children elect through the democratic process, we teach them about democracy, elect a children's parliament. The prime minister is elected by 7,000 children. Prime minister is 12 years old. She looks after 20 goats in the morning, but she's prime minister in the evening. <laughs> she has a cabinet, Minister for Education, Minister for Energy, Minister for Environment, and they monitor, supervise, and administer their own schools. Five years ago, she won the World's Children's Prize, and the Prime Minister went to Sweden to get it from the Queen of Sweden. First time she'd ever been outside her village in her life. And she took to Sweden as if she'd been there all her life. Queen of Sweden turns to me and says, please ask this little girl, 12 years old, how did, where did she get her confidence from? You know, she seems to have fit in very well. So I asked the Prime Minister, who was on the left, where did you get your confidence from? She looked at the Queen straight in the eye and said, please tell her I'm the Prime Minister. <laughs> Where the percentage of illiteracy is very high and there's no radio and then there's no printed word, there's no television, we use puppetry. Puppets is a very powerful communication media for us. This man is Joachim Chacha. He's 300 years old. He knows all the gossips in the village. He's my psychoanalyst. He's my doctor. He's my teacher. He's my donor. He solves all my problems for me. And whenever there's a crisis I have in a village, I call Joachim Chacha, and he solves all my problems. He brings all the community together. He's a legend. Whenever you want someone to solve problems for me, Joachim Chacha is there. Over 100,000 people see these puppet shows. All these puppets are made out of recycled World Bank reports. <laughs> if, you should have so, if you should come to the Barefoot College, you'll get solar cooked food. And these solar cookers are fabricated by grandmothers who never don't know how to read and write. But 60 meals twice a day you get through this college. Is a sophisticated clock which moves the solar cooker with the sun. And this woman has, has designed it. It's the only college which is fully solar energized. All the power comes from the sun. And we have a barefoot teacher who's a priest who has actually trained these women. We have 100 kilowatts of panels on the roof, and all our power comes from the sun. What is the most powerful way of communicating today? Television, telephone, telegraph, tell a woman. <laughs> so we only train women. 
And the women are the change agents of the world today, we believe. So we pick these women up from very poor, inaccessible, non-electrified communities, and we train them to be solar engineers. We're going to Africa between 2008 and 2013. We have covered almost the whole continent of Africa. This is the light that they use. Unacceptable. So what we did was we went, what is the barefoot model? Bottom up. We trained, the, we, are, we go to the whole community, get them together, find out how much they spend on diesel and kerosene and candles. If they're willing to pay five to ten dollars for solar, they agree, they sign on the dotted line, and then the whole community has to select a grandmother. Illiterate, rural, never been to school and college, grandmother. And they through an, enorm through an extraordinary arrangement with the government of India, we bring these grandmothers from they, where they are from to, call, to, to Barefoot College. They all sit together, chatter, 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 but they don't understand a word <laughs> because they're all speaking Jola, Swahili, Spanish. But within six months, they become solar engineers through sight and sound, not the written word, or the spoken word. Through sight and sound, they become solar engineers. We have covered almost the whole continent of Africa. There are 20 grandmothers in the Pacific, fully solar engineers from seven Pacific islands. We need your help, ladies and gentlemen, to bring solar equipment to these grandmothers in the Pacific. They are all from Solomon Islands, Samoa, Vanuatu, Kiribati, all been to Thelonia and back. Greatest supporter, Michelle Bachelet, next president of Chile. She supported us and she marveled at these grandmothers who became solar engineers. They all go back and without the help of any solar engineer, solar electrify the villages all over their villages in their countries. So today, this is the first village ever to be solar electrified by a grandmother in Afghanistan. We need partners. The government of India trains them in India, but we need partners and foundations and private partners to look for solar equipment. So we have the Bank of America Foundation, we have the UNDP, we have the UN Women giving us money for solar equipment. Four 40 watt panels on each roof with a battery and in between everything is fabricated by the grandmother. Can you imagine? If you ask any solar engineer, they say you need to go through five years of university. But this grandmother can make a charge controller on the spot in the most primitive conditions in the village. So you have the first technically and financially solar electrified villages in the world all looked after by grandmothers. So, 64 countries around the world, over 500 grandmothers have been trained, and not one has actually let me down. Most of them come, husband saying, if you go, I'll take another wife. Six months, can't wait. <laughs> she goes with sheer guts, comes back, and the husband says, now please come back, I'm totally intimidated by you. You've so electrified the whole village, so I ask these women, are your husband scared of you now? They said, yes, they're petrified of us because we've been to <laughs> India and back. His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to see us and bless the solar engineers of India, of Africa. And he said something very profound. He said, he made a puppet of it. <laughs> he loved it. He said something very profound. He said, now that you've shown the Barefoot College working in practice, let's see if the experts and professors can make it work in theory. <laughs> Thank you.